Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back to Deer University, folks. Bronson and I have a really exciting program today with a great longtime friend and colleague and and, uh, one of the shall we say, pillars of, of deer behavioral knowledge in, in the United States, Dr. Carl Miller, University of Georgia Deer Lab, and now retired, but still keeping his fingers in the research projects over there and, and uh, spewing out great knowledge. Welcome, Carl. Well, glad to be here. Don't know if I've ever been called a pillar before. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> <clears throat> Carl, when I was an undergrad, um, so this would have been like 1993, you, you were called a lot of things by us undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> it was all good. Like, like every professor wants to envision, it, it was all glowing. Trust me. Yeah. But Carl, yeah, that- it, it's great to see you again. Yeah, so the really cool thing about the three of us is we've we've been uh, together in, in the world of deer research for, Carl and I started as young PhDs back in the, I don't know, 1980s or so. Were we that old, Carl? Um, that old. And then Bronson came along and, and is is a, a generation behind us, but still kind of pushing up the age a little bit too. So we, we've got collectively probably uh, over 100 maybe 130 years of deer research doing what we love. And and the cool thing is we get paid to do stuff that a lot of our audience would like pay to be able to do. And that's really a blessing. And, and I just want to share that with our audience about how wonderful it is to have been and had our careers. Steve, I think you're probably like me that when you were young, you would have never envisioned the opportunities we've had to impact the deer world, but ex- go to work every day and have every every day of work be fun. Well, it it is an honor for me uh, to to be able to, I see Steve all the time. So, you know, it's not so much an honor anymore with Steve. No, I'm joking. I'm sorry. Uh, but Carl, it is great to see. It's great to see you again. It's, it's been a number of, of years now, so it's great to see you again. Great to, to talk to you. And uh, it really is. I get nostalgic thinking about in the in the early 1990s as an undergraduate taking classes from you and uh, just appreciate everything you've done and, and being a mentor uh, to me and others. So thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome, but I'll tell you what, both what Steve said and what you just said just really make me feel old now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we got to face reality. We're not getting younger. Yeah, you know, this is true. But it's been a fun ride. Sure has. Yeah, what we wanted to talk with you about today, Carl, is because of your your depth and breadth of, of knowledge and deer behavior, uh, you, you've done a lot of work in the scrape world and, and that particular behavioral component. And we want to kind of talk about scrapes and, and go beyond just, you know, what is it and why do they do it? But we want to, for those that maybe aren't up on all the latest interpretations, maybe start out with um, you kind of what are scrapes? Why, why do they, how do they function? What's their role? Steve, I'd suggest that what we might want to do is not divorce scrapes from rubs themselves as well and talk about both scrapes and rubs together, if that's good with you guys, because I think they do convey similar types of information in, in some cases as well. You know, when I first came to Georgia working with Larry Marchington back in the early 1980s, he had just started some of his work with some of his graduate students, uh, Gerald Moore and uh, Kyle and so forth. 
And this was, they were kind of the first to identify some of the significance of rubbing and scraping in deer populations. And they, they came up with some really interesting ideas. And when Larry and I got together, we decided to pursue a lot more of that. And that's a lot of what the focus of my dissertation was. And then after I got on the faculty here at Georgia, that was a lot of the focus of what, what uh, our research was as well. And uh, it's, <laughs> you'd think after 30 or 40 years of research, you'd figure things out. But I think there's still a lot we haven't figured out about deer. And I, th I think it's like any other research question. The more, the more questions you answer, the more questions you have. So let's let's talk about you know just you know the kind of the, the biology of the rut first you know as far as it related to what's called signpost communication and signposts or communication are these rubs and scrapes signposts are those types of, of communicative mechanisms that animals leave out there in their absence so a deer leaves a a sign either as a rub either as a visual signal but more so as an olfactory signal and the same thing with scrapes they're leaving it there in their absence. So they're communicating something even when they're not there. So it is like a signpost, hence the name. So generally right after the, the, the shedding of velvet, uh, bucks start rubbing their antlers and the base of their antlers on trees. And it was it's originally thought that they did this to scrape the velvet off their antlers. You know, and I think, you know, there might even be some hunters that still believe that, but that is absolutely not true. They can shed their velvet without even ever touching a tree. But what happens with these, these rubs is they are a communicative mechanism because the, the area between the antlers on the forehead of a white-tailed deer has what's called a forehead patch or a forehead gland. It's not really a gland itself, but it's an area of enhanced glandular activity that's under the influence of testosterone. So as the testosterone level goes up in the fall, that causes velvet shedding, that gland becomes much more active and starts to secrete a number of volatile uh, compounds. And when a buck makes a rub, he's transferring those volatile compounds onto that rub uh, out in the environment that can persist out there for four to five, six days. Uh, at least that's what you know, trained dogs have been able to, to tell us. And that is a communication between other bucks in the area to let them know of their presence in the area and let them know who they are. Uh, because, you know, bucks don't necessarily run together at all times. Yeah, they, this is the time when bachelor groups are breaking up. Uh, so there's a lot of shuffling going on in the deer world as well. And it's also a communication between the bucks and the does to, to kind of broadcast their presence. So these rubs are made, we, we used to think the rubs were made primarily early in the pre, in the pre rut, in the pre, you know, before the, the rutting season, right, right after velvet shed. And that was based on some studies that actually were on hunted populations. And on those hunted populations, the number of rubs made every, you know, on a weekly basis would tend to decline as the number of bucks declined, right? But if you look at unhunted populations, it looks like the number of rubs made out throughout the rut is pretty consistent weekly, all the way from velvet shedding, all the way till, till antlers are cast, you know, late, later in the, in the, uh, after the rut. So rubs are, rubs are pretty important when it comes, and it, it, it's kind of surprising the number of rubs that are actually made out there. Um, John Lazaga up in Michigan, and then some of our work as well has shown that, you know, more mature bucks, uh, two and a half and older bucks, three, maybe three and a half and older bucks, probably make in, in, in order of 50% or more rubs than would a yearling buck. They're much more active in this, because they are much, they, they know what's up. This is not their first rut that they're going through as a breeder. Uh, so they are much more active in this communication and they have a lot more to communicate as well. So, you know, again, this is a, a, an important communicative mechanism between the bucks or among the bucks and between bucks and does. Well, let, let me ask you something there, Carl. Um, and, and this may be pertain more to scrapes, but so it, it is a signpost for communication. And, and I know this is going to be a subjective type question. We, we're never going to be able to fully figure out what's going on in the deer's head, of course. But um, what kind of information do you think these signposts, and let's maybe stay with rubs right now, what is it conveying? Is it simply conveying that I'm an individual and I'm here in space and time? Or is there other biological information conveyed about the animal? That's a great question. And 
until we can get inside a deer's head, it's, it's impossible to actually determine that for 100% certainty. But based on what we know about the chemical constituents of the rubs and, the, and what's produced at the scrapes, and the scrapes are going to be very different than the rubs that we're talking about. They're going to convey some of the same information, but there's going to be additional information conveyed by scrapes because they're a different behavior. But based on what we know about the volatile compounds, that there's not a really a qualitative or even a quantitative difference much between uh, uh, the different classes of bucks. I think it's much more that they're uh, relating presence more than anything. It's just identity, just to let everybody know who's in the area. Say, I, I was here, I was here. You know, it's like uh, a guy stopping in the bar after work or something like that and said, tells the bartender, he says, hey, if uh, Joe, Joe comes by, tell him I was here. It's, it's one of those things to let other people know because but these animals are very social animals, but they don't live in a social environment. They don't live in, a, in, in groups like, you know, some of the other cervid species. So they have to have a way of communicating the fact that they are actually in the area. So it doesn't come as, surprise, as a surprise to each other when they run into each other. And it's the same thing that they're communicating with the does. The does are learning that there are a lot of bucks around here, you know, that they, you know, when it comes time, uh, there's, you know, I don't have to go looking. Now, the question is, if, are they being able to assess quality of those bucks? That may not be the case so much with rubs, but I think that's more so the case with scrapes. And we'll get into that when we talk more about scrapes. But when you think about the number of rubs that are actually made out there, it's actually an incredible number. You know, some of our estimates are that, you know, bucks may make on the neighborhood of somewhere around three to 400 rubs in a year. But given that we know that mature bucks make a lot more than, than uh, subordinate bucks and, and, and younger bucks, and some bucks do more than even some mature bucks make more than other ones, it depends on their deernality, their personality. Uh, there could be more, you know, bucks could be making more than a thousand rubs in a rut, which is, you know, several a day. Wow. That's, that's an incredible number. You know, we, we've come up with, in some areas, in some of our research, the high end of, we, you know, on some heavier deer populations with more mature age structures, we came up with over 3,000, close to 4,000 rubs per square mile. That's a lot of rubs. Whoa. 4,000 per square that's a mile. Lot of rubs. You know, that's, that's what, several per acre. That's six per acre. That's, you know, across the entire area. That's a lot of communication, you know, and some people always say, well, I don't see a lot of those rubs, you know, when I'm out there hunting or I'm scouting or something, I don't see many rubs. Well, that may have to do with the, the deer density, but probably more so the age structure and the sex ratio of the deer herd you're dealing with. But it also may be that there may not be a lot of trees out there that, that you know, the bucks prefer to rub on as well. You know, if you're in a big open hardwood system where, where there's not very many trees to rubs, the bucks aren't going to make that many rubs. So it's availability of rubbing material as well comes into play. So the does visiting the scrape or the rub, um, is there a difference, different rate of visitation by does to a rub versus a scrape? Um, I, that's kind of an unknown uh, because people haven't set up a whole lot of cameras over rubs. But some of the work that uh, actually one of Larry Marsh and his students did years ago, where he had some tame does, hand tamed does that were actually wild, and he could follow them around 24 hours a day and night. What a what a way to collect your research is just following a deer through the woods for your entire an entire rut. But uh, he was able to document a lot of really interesting behaviors, and he did document some some of these does responding to what were considered to be fresh rubs. And sometimes they actually may walk up to these rubs and rub their own head on them. Because we, and we know that, the, and then that's very infrequent, but we know that the activity of their forehead gland does increase slightly during the breeding season as well. That forehead batch, that, that glandular activity in the forehead is, is, like I said, is under the influence of testosterone. It's much more active in mature bucks, less active in, in immature bucks, but still increases a little bit even in does as well. Now there's a, Grant Woods kind of carried this to the next level when he was doing his research, and he looked at a lot of these uh, rubs in some areas where there were a lot of mature bucks, some of the first areas that were under, managed under the quality deer management paradigm uh, in South Carolina. And he was able to document a kind of a unique feature about some rubs. That these some rubs become what are called traditional rubs. 
And these are rubs that, that may serve a little bit of a different, uh, a different role in communication because they are more of a signpost that's reutilized. Most rubs are never re-rubbed. They're just rubbed and then they're, they're let go. And, and, you know, if you watch a buck make a rub, a lot of times they will stop, smell it, lick it, rub it some more until they're satisfied with the scent that's left there. But that scent dissipates through time. But these traditional rubs typically are on much larger trees, you know, four, five, six inches in diameter. They've shown evidence of being rubbed in multiple years for, you know, some of them scarring as much as five, six years, you know, repeatedly. And with some cameras on there, you get a, a, a kind of a series of different bucks coming in there and utilizing these rubs as well. And it's kind of one of those situations where it's a signpost, but it's a signpost where it's not only does it say, hey, I'm here, it's a signpost for other deer to come and say, hey, me too. When these deer sometimes come back to it and he says, I'm still here type situation. So these become much more, uh, imp they're probably much more important as far as communication among these mature bucks. And we really didn't have a real, you know, an understanding that these things actually even occurred until we started getting into this uh, deer management where we actually got some mature bucks out there and started seeing behaviors that we never saw in some of these herds where we had, you know, young age structures. So they're, 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 an, they're an, an, an interesting to deal with. And uh, I think a lot of people have seen that, oh, oh, you know, these, these rubs on trees that are rubbed for multiple years. So Carl, to me that um, s some things you said there, like with uh, the, the frequency at which bucks are making these rubs, they're, they're so common. And you said that most of the time, of course, there's always exceptions, but uh, most of these rubs are not re-rubbed. But so you hear people talk a lot about using, quote, rub lines strategically for hunting. And to me, that would be landscape specific. It would depend on if, uh, if I'm in an area, let's say I'm in an agricultural area, and there's relatively few trees on the landscape, relatively a little cover on the landscape with uh, wooded corridors, I could see where hunting a rub line could be strategic. But the way I look at that is because that rub line is confined to an area where there's cover. And so if you put that in a Southeastern context where basically there's trees everywhere, and bucks are rubbing so frequently every day and throughout the season. Is finding quote a rub line a good a good strategy for hunting? I think if if you use your head about it and really understand what those rubs could be telling you. Now, very simply, if a rub's there, that means a buck was there. And if you're in an area where there's no rubs, that means there were no bucks there. So it's obviously a point where you need to start looking, you know, that this might be a situation where, you you know, the bucks are frequenting. If they're relatively fresh and they seem to be along a what, what is called a line, which means a, a, a direction of travel, these bucks, you have to understand what these bucks are doing and when they're doing it. You know, if this is a travel quarter that they're using at nighttime, they're making these rubs at night, it's not going to be much helpful for you, right? But if you have one that, you know, that's leading to or from an agricultural field where they're going at nighttime to feed and then they're going to a bedding area and that rub line is between those, those might be a place where you can actually use those rub lines to intercept those deer. You know, the, the fact is because the rub's there, it means a buck at least was there. You know, so it's helpful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily that if I say if I yeah. found rubs, I would hunt the rubs, but they tell you some information that you can use when you're scouting. Yeah, and our work with uh, scrapes in the last few years, Carl, has, has shown that most of the scraping activity is still at night, uh, you know, after hunting hours. Mm -hmm. Is that your experience, and does that apply also to rubs? Yeah, and, and that, that some of the first work with that was done by uh, one of my graduate students, Karen Alexi, uh, and, with, and John Gassett. They were some of the first to put some cameras out on scrapes, and they did. They found some really neat stuff about the timing of scrapes and utilization of scrapes as well. And most of that, like you said, is at night. You know, we I think they found that 85% of their buck use and 75% of their doe use of scrapes was at nighttime. So you know, unless you're hunting under artificial illumination, that might not be that helpful to you. You know, but. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, 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 you want to go ahead and talk about scrapes because they're a very different animal than rubs are and, and what's going goes on with the scrape. And I think most people understand what a scrape is, but they probably don't realize that what a scrape is is a combination of three separate behaviors. And sometimes those three behaviors occur independent of each other. The first of those behaviors is when a buck makes a scrape, it walks up to an overhanging branch, uh, generally red, you know, at, at red at head high. They work that overhead head hanging branch, and they're leaving a scent there at that overhanging branch. Now, what the source of that scent is is debatable. Some people say it's a preorbital gland. Well, we haven't found any indication that the preorbital gland is even active as a scent-producing gland in whitetails. Some suggest it might be the nasal gland, same thing. We don't know anything about the utility of it or the importance of that as a scent-producing gland. Saliva might be another one because we know that the bucks are working these branches with their mouths and they're pulling it down with their mouths. And the forehead gland might also be uh, important there as well. And my guess is the forehead gland probably has the most important role there. And it relates that same buck back to some of the rubs that were made in that area as well. So this becomes a, you know, just a, tr- a transfer of the same information with additional information onto it. So they work these overhanging branches, typically when they make a scrape. What a lot of people don't realize is a lot of these overhanging branches in some areas may be utilized throughout the year for this purpose. And uh, it was documented a number of years ago, it's called a, they called it a licking branch. And even during the midsummer, a lot of these bucks would come and, and there'd be a progression of bucks using these licking branches, the same thing conveying that that information of I am here. This is, you know, it's a presence type thing. And it's probably related to the forehead gland as well. Now, it, it's kind of interesting. I just thought about this right now as we're talking. If the forehead gland is involved in the overhanging branch and it's involved in the, the, the rubs as well, why are they working the forehead branch on, the, on these licking branches during the summertime and not making rubs? Well, they're not making rubs because they got velvet on their antlers and they can't, right? So... This is, this is a mechanism where they could transfer that same type of information to it to a, something that's going to cause, won't cause any damage to their, their uh, developing antlers. But anyways, moving on to the, to the next thing is, you know, typically after that, a buckle would kind of pause a second and then paw the ground with, uh, with, with its hooves, removing a bunch of leaf litter on the ground. You know, the question is, why are they doing that? Uh, some people say, you know, because they want to expose the earth, you know, but um, it's probably more likely that they're leaving a scent there from their interdigital gland. The interdigital gland, that's hard to say, interdigital gland is a gland <laughs> that's located between the hooves on all four feet. And if you ever push your nose to it, it kind of has a little bit of an aroma like rancid butter. Uh, and there's a number of volatile compounds in that thing. Um, uh, one of my graduate students, John Gasson, did some analysis of the volatiles there, and he found there were 46 different compounds associated that he identified. Now, obviously, there are very many more uh, because of the analytical techniques that he used and so forth. But of, of those 46, 11 of those compounds were more in, in higher concentrations in dominant animals than in subordinate animals or mature animals versus young animals. Hmm. So what does that kind of tell you? It says, mm-hmm. well, maybe that pawing of the ground is leaving a scent there, and that scent may have some indication of the relative dominant status, or at least the relative testosterone level or level of aggression that that might that buck, the maker of that scrape or the visitor of that scrape may have. So they're getting something to they they found out from the branch something about an identity. They found out from the pawing of the ground maybe, and this is all conjecture of course, but maybe they found out something about the personality or the level of aggression, or the level of dominance, or whatever, you know, something about that, the maker of that, that scrape. After that, they then step forward, and then they'll urinate, typically, particularly a mature buck will, but urinate over their tarsal glands into that scrape, and then anointing that scrape with some, some of the, the, the product from their tarsal gland as well, which the tarsal gland is a, in itself is a very unique and very complex organ to produce something that smells as bad as a buck smells and we could get into that but that actually probably that more likely conveys a lot more to do with the personality of that animal the dominant status of that animal the relative breeding capability of that animal or you know the libido of that animal uh you know 
typically, I think you'd all agree, every time you see, the more aggressive you see a buck, the, usually the more stained his tarsal glands are. And that, that level of aggression is there. Uh, and so they're leaving all that information there. Now, what's the purpose of that information? Well, they're leaving it there for all the other bucks to know. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they know that each other is there in their, in their absence, but they all know something about me now in, you know, in my absence. But also the does are learning something as well. And what's really unique about scrapes is almost invariably, every study I've ever looked at that looked at scraping activity throughout the rut, the peak level of scraping activity almost always occurs exactly two weeks before the peak of the rut. Now, why might that be? That's a real intriguing one, isn't it? But uh, years ago, we had a student um, who did some work with, uh, we used a surrogate species of deer, but looked at the influence of, of, of uh, Ells deer stags on the, the uh reproduction physiology of female uh, elves deer and found that the presence or just the urine from an elves deer male could not only is stimulate but could synchronize estrus in these females now the question is and we know that happens a lot in other species of, of ungulates as well so if you think about whitetail wouldn't it make sense then that if it occurs two weeks before, prior to the peak of the rut Something these bucks are communicating to the does is stimulating their reproductive reproductive uh, physiology to bring them into estrus uh, at an appropriate time um, you know, to, to synchronize that estrus because you know Mother Nature would prefer having a synchronous estrus so you have a synchronous breeding season, right, or, or fawning season. So. What happens in, in, in the, the, the developing follicles or the, in, in the ovaries of these females is there's follicular waves going on and these follicles are growing and regressing and growing and regressing to, until they reach a certain point, which actually that follicle will then ovulate. But it has to follow an LH, a, a, a certain surge in the hormones. And it may be that this, the priming mechanism of these bucks is affecting the physiology to allow that follicular wave to reach maturity in these does at rel relatively the same time. And I think there's a lot of other evidence that this might be the case because you know, think about it, you know that, you know, that it, in, deer herds would have a lot of mature animals in it and, you know, more even sex ratio and a bit more natural age structure. We tend to have a much more synchronous rut. But in areas where we have a young age structure and particularly just a lot of yearling bucks out there where we see very few scrapes, a lot of times we have a very asynchronous rut. Maybe it's because the priming mechanism is not there. John Ozaga and his work up in Michigan showed that mature bucks make 85% as many scrapes, 85% more scrapes than, or let's put it this way, yearling bucks make 15% as many scrapes as would a mature buck. So yearling bucks are not really getting involved in the scraping activity. So they're not communicating this. They're not communicating this physio physiological primer to these does. And if they're not, you know, if they're not communicating, then the does will come in estrus when, you know, the, prime, the priming factor isn't there. It could come into estrus at any time at that point, right? So they're under the influence of photo period. It's up, you know, to, to come into, they got to come into heat sometime in the fall. But I think the, the presence of those mature bucks at these scrape sites can tweak that to occur at a certain time and to synchronize it more. So, so photo period is going to provide that window, and then within that, there's some some latitude. So it could be accelerated and then synchronized based on the buck composition of the population. Exactly. You just said what I said a lot shorter, but <laughs> much more concisely. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that that's uh, that's really really fascinating and and that was something steve and i were were talking about uh this morning carl is uh, you know what what role bucks are and, and i think the term you have used in the past is that priming mm -hmm. um the the signals that they're giving to to the female so yeah that's that's uh that's a <clears throat> fascinating yeah and you know that's even in animal husbandry and goats they they use what is called a goat jar to synchronize these 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 nanny goats that, that synchronize their estrus when it is mainly the scent of the urine of those those male goats, you know, and a male goat stinks like a mature buck does too. Another aspect of this is you know the, the, 
the actual physiology of the tarsal gland and how that actually works because it comes into play because it is reflective of the male's physiology itself. And therefore it's gonna be reflective of the male's libido. And this looks like it's kind of nature's way of making sure that the males and the female are in peak reproductive condition simultaneously. Photo period is a pretty coarse thing to look at. So if you wanna really synchronize, you need to look at something that the, the animals are communicating to each other. And these bucks are also communicating to each other, but they're communicating to the does, and maybe the does are communicating back some at these scrape sites. But do um, you ever wonder how something got to smell as bad as a tarsal gland smells? And it's kind of a unique story of how we, you know, we, we, we kind of tease this apart, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of neat how this actually happens. If you ever watch, if you ever smell the tarsal gland, it doesn't smell at all like buck urine, right? But it turns out that buck, the, the tarsal gland is not the source of that smell at all. The tarsal gland, those tar long tarsal hairs there, they are just a mechanism to hold that scent there on the animal. It doesn't produce really any scent itself. But how does this get to stink so bad? Well, it turns out it, inside every animal, in, uh, in, in, inside the, the deer, there are all kinds of hormones going around, particularly things like the steroid hormones, testosterone and so forth. And they go around in our bloodstream and they're water soluble compounds because they're in the bloodstream. And, but typically the, so the steroid hormones are not water soluble. So what the body does is they conjugate them with a sulfonylurea or glucanurea, some type of carbohydrate to make them water soluble so they can get around in the bloodstream. But it also allows them to work at their target where, where they're supposed to work physiologically, but allows the kidneys to grab a hold of them and excrete them in the urine. So when a deer urinates over its tarsal gland, it's producing, a, you know, putting a lot of those, those steroid hormones on its tarsal gland. But they're in an aqueous form and they don't have a smell. So how does the smell occur? Well, it turns out underneath the hairs of the tarsal gland, there are some grossly enlarged, what are called sebaceous glands. And these are glands that produce a greasy kind of fat material. And that greasy fat material goes out and coats these hairs. And their function is to hold that scent there on the tarsal gland. But we've got an issue here. We've got fat on the, tar on the hairs of the tarsal gland but we've got the steroids that are in an, a phase that they're water soluble. So how does this work? Oil and water don't mix, right? Well, it turns out, and this is some work that John Gasson did as well, that he looked at the bacterial composition of the tarsal gland itself. And there are a lot of different types of bacteria located on the tarsal gland, as you would expect, some of which are not real, you know, no, they're known human pathogens as well. But of all the different types of bacteria there, there's one called a carinobacteria that makes us live out of breaking that bond between the steroid and that conjugate that was put on there. But therefore freeing up that free steroid and changing it from a water soluble compound to a fat soluble compound. So then that fat soluble compound can adhere to the tarsal gland, the fatty area on the tarsal gland itself. But what's really neat is in its aqueous form, it doesn't have much of an aroma. But when it's in its free state, it takes on a very musky aroma, basically the aroma of the tarsal gland. So isn't it interesting how God designed something to make something stink that bad? <laughs> it was such a complex mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, Carl, you, you mentioned uh, the disease, potential bacterial diseases and all. You had a personal experience working with urine, didn't you? Or urine compound, synthetic compound? Um, I, I've, I've had a lot of different experiences. Um, I don't know which one you're <laughs> referring to, but there was one time when I was working on my PhD many, many years ago, um, that I caught something, assuming that it came from the deer, what it was that I caught, I don't know, but it was something that was a, a gastrointestinal thing that um, I kept Charmin in business for a long, for several months before that thing cleared <laughs> up. And they never could figure out what it was. Uh, they could never diagnose anything from it. Uh, so they finally just cleaned me out with everything and took care of it. Very likely it was something I got from the deer. But you know, the, the point is the tarsal gland does have some known human pathogens like E. coli and some staph and uh, listeria and so forth in there. So. You know, if you kill a deer and you're messing with the tarsal gland, don't put a dip of tobacco in your mouth or stick your finger in your eye or something like that. You know, make sure you keep your hands clean. 
it's a stinking thing you don't want to get on your hands, but it's it's actually can be worse than that. Well, with these these bucks putting out, you know, back to the idea that scrapes are a signpost. Bucks are urinating, pawing, uh, applying their individual scents. Is a an adult doe able to, you know? Is, is there evidence or your opinion, is a, an adult doe able to differentiate individual bucks when she visits? You know, I, 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 I don't know. Well, I, I don't know the answer to it, and I don't know how anybody, un, other than they, if you could ask the doe, could, could answer that question. But my thought is yes. I, it would make sense to me that it would be yes. Because, you know, there's female selection and male selection. A male's going to select any doe that, that'll breed to, but the female wants to select the best quality male that she can see. That's why males are, are large. They have large antlers for display and so forth. So it very much would be very likely that some of the scents that are produced as well would be reflected of their genetic capability or their genetic fitness. So it would make sense that she could actually determine that, that herself. She could probably also determine the degree of relatedness that she has to that animal, which she obviously doesn't want to relate, you know, breed to something that was closely related. You wanted to, you know, some genetic, some hybrid vigor there. So she might be looking for something that's a little bit more genetically different than her, which may be why we, you know, we, we, I know you guys, when we have, when, in some of our radio telemetry study, have documented these excursions by does during when we feel like they were in estrus. There were likely bucks in their their home range when they came into estrus. So why did they go and travel, you know, two, three, four miles away during the period they were in estrus? Other than to find something that was more genetically or physiologically compatible to her. And that would obviously have to be based somewhat on the olfactory cues that she was getting from these bucks, either the rubs or scrapes or personally. That's where I was going next, Carl. So you you took my my question away, but yeah, it was like, what, what all evidence do we have there? It's uh, it's circumstantial to mm -hmm. to some degree, but but it does make a lot of sense that you know there there's two two way communication here. So you you've got the, these bucks that are also they're they're adver advertising, they're conveying their probably their social status, dominance, et cetera. Um, but, but then also the does are utilizing these signposts. So they're, they're reading what is available. And then I guess the hypothesis is, are then they availing themselves? I mean, they're, they're not going to be able to select the buck. I choose you and, and, and pursue him like a buck is going to do a doe. But you're thinking, Car Carl, she is availing herself by being in the where she suspects the buck is going to be when she's coming into estrus. That that's the only proactive way she can uh, select what male she wants to breed with. Right. I mean, she she can increase her odds of being bred by that buck, but that, there's no guarantee because there's yeah. scramble competition going on among those bucks that whoever is the the, the winner of that. Or depending on the situation, uh, she may be bred by somebody she, of not her choosing. Because when she comes in heat, you know, then she, and typically they go on these excursions prior to them coming into heat. They get this period of activity, you know, where they get, uh, John Azaga documented this years ago that, you know, right before estrus, they get this restlessness. And that's probably related to this, you know, wanting to go on these excursions. And... Uh, because at the point when they come in heat, they are physiologically compelled to stand for whatever male. Uh, it's called lower doses, you know, that, 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 that behavior that you can, even, you know, you've probably seen it in the deer pen. When a doe comes in heat, you can press on her back and she will just stand, you know, she'll freeze, right? Um, so her choice is given up at that point. But her choice could occur, at, you know, prior to that when she has the opportunity to be in an area where there may be a buck that she wants to deal with. You know, like you said, it yeah. works two ways as well. You know, an interesting aspect of this uh, occurs, you know, that, and we know that sometimes does visit scrapes and sometimes the does will even urinate at scrape sites. But one of the things we know about bucks as well is particularly during the, you know, closer to the peak of the rut, when they encounter, you know, when they're walking along or watch a doe urinate, sometimes they will either watch a doe urinate and go up and investigate that urine, or they could just smell a urine spot out there 
many times they'll take this urine up into their mouth and you know lick on that urine and they'll do this behavior called Fleeman behavior and this Fleeman behavior what's intri intriguing about that is what they're doing is they're actually introducing it into a separate sense organ that a deer has that you know we, we don't have the equivalent of it's called the vomeral nasal organ and it's located in the roof of their mouth and it is used specifically specifically for analyzing molecules of, of generally low volatility that they can't really smell with their nose. But what's really intriguing about the vulnerable nasal organ, and this hasn't been pa uh, patterned out in deer, but in other species that we know of that, that they've, they've done the physio or the anatomy of this, the vulnerable nasal organ doesn't tie into the part of the brain, the main olfactory system that is then tied into the part of the brain that controls behavior. But instead, the vomeral nasal system is tied into a much more primitive, primitive part of the, the brain, the limbic system, basically the, the, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It goes, to the obsess it goes to the accessory olfactory bulb separately and then goes to this part of the brain that controls the reproductive physiology of the male. Now, doesn't that kind of intrigue you a little bit when you think that they're taking urine up into their mouth that they're analyzing that and it's controlling their physiology. So they're getting information from that doe that they don't even know what they're getting. It's not affecting their behavior at all. It's affecting their, their libido, their physiology. So it brings them, you know, it's a doe's way of synchronizing the bucks and making sure they're in peak reproductive condition at the same time the does are in peak reproductive condition. That's my story, at least I'm sticking to it. Well, I'm glad humans use words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we communicate differently. <laughs> exactly. That's what I always tell, tell, tell when I'm giving a presentation like that. I said, you know, humans are a vision-oriented species. Deer are not necessarily so. And at this point, I said, aren't you glad? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and it makes sense, Carl, what you're saying about the ability to differentiate individuals and, and even even more. If we look at what dogs can do, they're, they're dogs trained to tell whether or not somebody is, their blood sugar is high or, you know, the disease status of, of an individual human. And there's also work with uh, dogs identifying feces from deer that have CWD versus deer that don't. I mean, so their nasal capabilities are way beyond, we can't even comprehend what they get from what they smell and a deer to me is going to be just as good as a dog from for smelling yeah it, you know it, you know the, the ability to smell depends on which what uh sensory receptors you have in your you know your nasal epithelium but it's, it's clear that you know compared to us deer live in a different world you know what is their capability to, compared to a dog it depends on the species of dog and it also depends on what the, the actual volatile compound is but I would say that certainly there are things that a deer can smell even probably better than a dog can. And some of that's going to be related to reproduction and social communication. The other aspect of it is going to be related to, you know, finding food sources because deer find food by smelling it, not by looking for it. A moment ago, when we were talking about rubs, you were talking about there's the there's certain uh, certain rubs they're, they're pretty rare on the landscape, but there's a lot of evidence. And if you've been in the woods enough and hunted enough, you've certainly seen some of these trees that are visited by probably several different bucks and several years in a row. So, so what we also see, uh, most people have seen uh, whatever the appropriate name is, but super scrapes. You know, it's these really appear to be larger scrapes and and a lot of deer are using them and a study uh steve led recently there was uh one scrape that had 39 individuals visiting that and our average was about 12. what do you think again you're hypothesizing here what do you think's going on at these infrequent scrapes on the landscape that are so frequently visited is it just is it spatially that it's in a travel corridor and it's just a place where a lot of deer are intersecting their travel routes or is there other is there some other reason for that in terms of uh 
communicating their physiological status or something like that? Uh, are, are we are we making um, are we making it too complicated to try to figure that out? Is it just because it's in an ideal place on the landscape? I think the answer to every question you ask is yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if, if you go back and look at some of our early work, and then we started, you know, that's, that started getting picked up by a lot of outdoor magazines. And during the 1990s and the early 2000s, there were all kinds of articles out there. Everybody and their brother wrote articles on scrapes. And they started talking about different types of scrapes, and boundary scrapes and territorial scrapes and breeding scrapes, and, you know, and how to identify each different one, you know. I don't think a buck walks around in the woods and say, okay, this looks like a space place where I'm going to put a boundary scrape here and do the same behaviors, but I'm going to go over there and put a territorial scrape and do the same behaviors. You know? So, you know, I think a lot of that was overblown, you know, conjecture. However, I, you know, we did the same thing with some of our early study with Karen and, you know, she found uh, one of her, one of her scrapes had 13 different bucks come to that scrape and she had 11 different bucks interact with that scrape, actually mark at the scrape. So what is going on in these situations? Well, I think, and I think you can look at the other extreme of scrapes that are not visited at all. And that's probably why these scrapes are small and they never got reutilized. But I think what you ended up, what, what you end up finding is these are probably at a hub of activity. And when I've noticed those types of scrapes, those large scrapes, They've always been at kind of travel corridors, areas, or edges of agricultural fields, someplace where you would expect different bucks to congregate. And I think they'd probably become hyper information. It's almost like a, a something, something going viral on the web. You know, everybody has to, has, to, has to see it, right? So I think a lot of these bucks come in there. They smell it. Obviously, it smells a lot more. You, you, you can smell these things yourself, these scrapes. So obviously, they are, they are attractive to any buck in the area. Uh, if these bachelor groups at this time are breaking up or have broken up and there's, you know, they're, they're, these bucks have expanded their ranges, they're going to visit these scrapes because they're attracted by the smell there. So they're going to interact with it. So I think they become very important in the, you know, the, the transfer of information. On the contrary, I think there's some other scrapes that a buck makes a scrape that, it, you know, it's never revisited and it just goes dead after, you know, after he leaves it. So, you know, so that one probably didn't have that much communicative significance. But I think you, you run a wide range of these, you know, scrape importance. And these things obviously are, if you're in an area where you have 39 different bucks to visit it, uh, they're, they're pretty hot places. Well, Carl, thinking back about Karen Alexi's work and, and, you know, that, that first report we saw at the Southeast Deer Study Group years ago about 13 bucks visiting a single scrape. I mean, that I remember that blew my mind. And thinking back about the equipment she had to develop to collect that information versus what's available now for, you know, 150 bucks on the, on the commercial market. Uh, I remember she had created like five gallon buckets that she covered with plastic and, and put a, a, a literally a video camera, home video camera in there with a battery. And, a you know, I mean, she rigged up this cool equipment that is now uh, so readily available and all of our listeners can, can do much more than, than what she was able to do at the time because of the, the development of the technology. Oh, certainly. Uh, what the, the, the basis for her, her, what she was able to do was, that was when they first, what they called trail master cameras came out. And all they would do was count deer that went by. But they, did, but she worked with John Gass and they electronically hooked it up that they could turn on and turn off a video camera at the same time. So when the trail master detected a, a deer, the video camera would click on. And this was, you know, where we had to look at the tape. It wasn't a download of an MP3 or anything like that, you know. Uh, so, so they had to sit there and visually look at every one of these videos and stuff. But it was really cool. You know, one other really thing, and I don't know if you guys have seen this in some of your work with scrapes, but we had, uh, she had two clusters of scrape, scrapes uh, on two different properties that were separated by two miles. And on one of the, the clusters of scrapes she had cameras on, she had all these different bucks come to these scrapes. But she also had some bucks that were harvested almost within sight of these scrapes throughout this study on a couple of different occasions that never showed up at any of those scrapes. 
which is an intriguing thought. Mm. I mean, I never quite figured out why. Two possibilities. These might have been bucks that, or three three possibilities. One of these, these might have been new bucks into an area that just had been, you know, roaming through an area. I don't think that's probably, that that's likely. Uh, two, it may be that these bucks had their own scrapes that they preferred to go to or that they visited more often and they didn't show up at these other scrapes. Um, or three, maybe there's some bucks out there that just don't get that involved in scraping activity. You know, we know there's a lot, some bucks make a lot more rubs. Some bucks are a lot more aggressive. Some bucks are much more passive. Uh, you know, Val Geis even talked about some bucks that in, in years, you know, in working with black tailed deer or was it mule deer, uh, that would opt out of breed, you know, the entire breeding season, just not even engage. So there, there's, I think there's a lot more questions that we have out there about what's going on with what these different animals are doing. And a lot of it depends on, mm -hmm. you know, and you've, we've all used the word deer analogy, their, their personality, different deer act differently. One of the cool things we noticed in our more recent work, you know, we had a hundred and right at a hundred trail cameras monitoring individual scrapes over 12,000 acres. And we tried to put them separated from each other, what we monitored. And even though we were distributed across 12,000 acres, the, the average scrape that we monitored or the average buck that we identified still uh, visited on average six different scrapes that we monitored. Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't monitor but a small percentage of the scrapes out there. Right. And, and so... Uh, yeah, I would love to have a camera on every single scrape and figure out just how many individual scrapes do those individual bucks visit and, and tie it back to their age and personalities. And there's so much cool work yet to be done uh, to build on, you know, the the cutting edge work that you started with Karen and John and, and Larry years ago. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, the, the full results of what you just saw because you're doing stuff that we had no capability of doing at the time. And this should take, you should be able to take this very much to the next level of what's, what's actually occurring. Did you see that there were some bucks that, that actually showed up in scrapes that were very far, you know, very distant from each other? You know, I told you we had these, these clusters of, of cameras at two different properties that were two miles apart. And we had some bucks that didn't show up on mm -hmm. cameras on one area. But showed we had some bucks that showed up on cameras on each one of the different clusters, two miles apart. So they would be at one cluster and then they'd be at another mm -hmm. cluster. That so they, you know they were traveling and utilizing that landscape, which again would probably you know suggest, Absolutely. suggest the importance of those scrapes for communicating presence. You know. Well, one of our statistics we calculated was of the scrapes that we documented in individual bucks visiting, what were the what are the linear distances connecting those? And, uh, you know, some of the bucks are, you know, covering 10, 12 miles in, in connecting the dots of all the scrapes. So there's a lot of movement, and and that supports what you were just saying. There's a lot of movement across the landscape of bucks right. visiting scrapes. Yeah, you know that that ties real well in your familiar with James Johnson stuff. He just got published uh, recently where he looked at these, you know, the bucks on a landscape, you know, buck to doe ratios on a landscape, and how that morphs throughout, you know, from the early rut to the peak of the rut, and you know, the, the high density areas where, like we said, bachelor groups in certain areas. But as he's as as the rut progresses, that whole deer society changes dramatically. And there's a lot of new individuals coming and going throughout that that period. So you've got to have some type of communicative mechanism there, or you just have total chaos. Well, one of the frustrations I think our listeners have is is they want, you know, some really simple this is what's gonna happen. And and you know, you've been talking about all these different personalities and age and, and individuals. I mean that struck me over the years too. There's so much variation in nature generally. Uh, you know, nature does try to synchronize some things, but having a lot of variation is inherent in any biological system. And so it's hard to come up with, okay, you need to work, you know, hunt near these kind of scrapes or these kind of, you know, applying it to 
landowners and hunters to beyond the, just the really cool ecology and understanding the behavior, which, which, you know, that floats my boat all day long is trying to understand what's going on from the deer standpoint. Why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? But um, can you come up with a couple of generalities about under, you know, how does a hunter or landowner apply what you've learned over the years to improve their hunting success? You mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the rubs being part of that equation, not sitting on a rub, but kind of getting between rubs. How do you apply that to scrapes also? When we first started doing this years ago, everybody, that, they got, there was a craze over hunting scrapes. But as your research and our research shows, most of the scrape activity is at night. You know, if you very early in the morning or very late at night, you may catch them coming and going or so forth, but it's probably not the most productive thing. But what a scrape tells you is, particularly if you have lots of scrapes and maybe some of these big, what you call these uh, interstate scrapes, uh, you know, that, that, that tells you that the bucks are there, right? you got a lot of activity going on and there's a lot of movement in that area. So that gives you one indication that you're in a, you're in a good area. But I think the most important thing scrapes tell you is what phase of the rut you're in. Is, you know, if you're right at the peak of scraping activity, you know, you've got about two weeks before you've got to completely change your, your hunting tactics to, to hunt the peak of the rut. Because when you're hunting the peak of the rut, you want to hunt places where a buck's going to be with a doe, you know, maybe looking even over a clear cut or, or trying to catch a buck that's on the move. But most of the bucks, particularly the mature bucks, are, are going to be locked down with a doe at that time. So trying to find or, 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 or actively looking. So they're, they're going to be moving a lot. That's the time to be in those particular areas. You know, if there's a you're at the peak of scraping activity, the bucks are probably not still not with does yet. That's when rattling will be a lot more effective, very likely. You know, so you know you can change you know use that technique. I would never rattle during the peak of the rut. You know, you put your rattling antlers away two weeks after the peak of scraping activity, because if you rattle while a buck's got a doe, he's going to turn that doe and go the other way with it, right? So you, you know you, you'll chase as many bucks away as you'll call in. So, you know, looking at the scrapes as it affects the timing of what's going on in the deer world and how that affects your hunting tactics, I think is the most important thing. Have you noticed any differences relative to the timing of the rut and, and whether or not it's younger bucks versus older bucks? Uh, you know, some of the, the work Randy DeYoung has done with with uh, multiple paternity in, in, uh, in deer has shown that uh, the majority of the yearling buck involvement in multiple paternity takes place around the peak of the rut when there's just so much going on. There's a lot of does bred and they can kind of slip in and, and get their breeding opportunities. Right. Anything like that relative to the breeding season in, in terms of different aged bucks visiting scrapes and rubs? That I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe your data has a lot more than that because you have a lot more. Your sample size is so much better than what we had back in the day. Um, and maybe you can. Your data speaks to the the timing of visitation by uh, uh, different uh, age classes. But you know, scrape visitation. A lot of times you look at the behaviors of deer at these scrapes, and you'll see these little yearling bucks come in, and most of them don't interact much with the scrape. You know, they may work the branch. You don't see them really rub urinate over the scrape. They, you know, they, they almost feel like they, they're worried about getting their caught with their hands in the cookie jar, you know. Uh, so they're, they're kind of nervous around those scrapes. Or might, you know, the scrape maker may show up, you know. But they're still compelled by their physiology to say, I got, this is something I got to do, you know. So their interaction with scrapes is going to be different than a, than a mature buck's interaction. And my guess is their their visitation to scrapes will be delayed compared to a mature buck as well, because this is kind of their first, this is their first go at it. They're still learning the whole rutting behaviors. They're still learning that, you know, what's, what's going on. They know that they're supposed to be doing something, but they haven't learned the manners. Like, you know, maybe like a 16, 17 year old boy, you know, they know that there's, you know, they, they've got the urge, but they don't know, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing yet. You know, they, they haven't matured. Uh, so, I, th I think that, you know, some of that behavior, you know, is going, you know, the, the scraping behavior related to mature bucks, those early scrapes, particularly the ones you see in advance of the, you know, the peak of scraping that you generally get right before the rut, there's going to be some of those early scrapes that are made in September or October or so forth. 
depending on where you are, those probably are, are most likely are done by mature bucks that you know know what's coming up. Uh, the young bucks, their their testosterone level at that level, at that age and that early in the season is still way too low for them to exhibit those types of behaviors. I don't know if that answered your question. It was kind of a rambling answer, but it, it depends. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Carl, one thing we were uh, looking at recently, and again, this this is something you you got to have a lot of data to to pick something like this up. So when you have uh, you know all these different cameras, you can see some of this. But we 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 noticed an uptick in scrape visitation in the in the post rut, and uh, so we were thinking, or you know, I'm hypothesizing here. Well, that that's probably you know, we're after the, after the peak rut, we've got some bucks that are again, trying to re-engage and, and locate estrus females. But t- turns out that uptick during the post rut is by fawns. And so, you know, it just makes you wonder wh- why is it that it's uh, some doe fawns that are uh, at the physiological condition later that they're actually coming in into estrus and so they're now getting engaged with uh, signposting and signaling, or is it that uh, we're at the post rut and it's just the age of the fawn? So they they didn't engage with the scrape, but now they're a month or six weeks older. They're starting to engage and figure this stuff out. Um, who knows? But what would be if you if you were to speculate? Why would you see this? uptick or increased frequency by fawns in the post rut? Well, that's an intriguing question. Now, we've seen similar upticks in scraping activity a month after the, the, the first peak of scraping activity, you know, after the peak of the rut. And it's always been our, our, our thought that, you know, the bucks are re-engaging and you get that second, what they call the second rut sometimes or delayed rut those animals that either didn't conceive when they were bred or those weren't that didn't get bred the first time they come into heat you know 27 28 days later um but that, we didn't notice any difference you know that that there was a fawn response to that that's that is intriguing um it very likely could be that you know how, it depends on how much fawn breeding you have on this particular area but we know that fawns if they do breed their first year are going to be delayed compared to you know mature does usually by at least a month or two and it may be what's going on there it may be that some of these fawns are if if they're you know if they're button bucks or doe fawns could you your cameras let you determine that or yeah that that's what's difficult to detect you know with these photos we we can't tell yeah so so you know you also got a lot of you probably have a lot of button bucks out there i would guess you're also, yeah. you know, that that now are dispersed or maybe even abandoned by mother because mother went on, you know, with, with the bucks. So they're trying to figure out what's going on in the world themselves. Either they're in a new area or at least they're by themselves uh, looking for some companionship, looking for some, you know, some social social outlet. Uh, so I think it could be one or the other, you know. It, 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 one one thing to look at is to determine whether these fawns are coming in by themselves, and if there's no doe associated with these fawns, that would suggest to me that there's it's one of the two causes. These does are either you know they, they, they're either you know they're either dispersed, and now they're solitary. They're not running with their mother, or they're they're doe fawns. That may be uh, this may be a precursor to them coming in estrus. Well, Steve, what else do you have, man? We got to be respectful of Carl's time here. Yes. And, and, uh, we've maybe pillared him enough for today <laughs> about, uh, uh, scrapes and, and rubs and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of touch base where we talked started earlier is just, it's great to talk with you, Carl, and, and hear these gems from all the cutting edge work done at UGA and, um, might give our, our listeners a, a heads up to future. Uh, interaction that we're actually we're working with uh, the UGA Deer Lab now. Gino, um, I guess Gino replaced you, D'Angelo. Right. Gino actually replaced Bob Warren. Okay, 
but th they have some collared deer over in Arkansas. We're going to be uh, working with them. They're going to allow us to come in and monitor scrapes around collared in the areas where collared deer are, bucks mm -hmm. and does. And we're going to do that up in uh, southern Tennessee and also up in West Virginia. So uh, we're going to be adding to our knowledge about these visitation rates and, and that percentage of bucks and does that actually visit that are versus what are the, the numbers that are in the area. So sometime in the future, we'll have to um, revisit this topic of, of scrape visitation. Yeah, we may have to do this somewhere over something cold in our hand uh, just to have some dis discussion of what you guys find. I, I think it's fascinating. I think it's uh, commendable that you guys are taking this basically to the next level. Some of the stuff we did, I've seen this like an old man now, but you know, the technology is out there to answer some of the questions that we couldn't answer. And I think, you, you know, looking at uh, across the landscape in different states, I think is, is a fascinating aspect of this as well. Particularly if you can get into some areas where you've got a high degree of rut syn synchrony, like north of the Mason Dixon line, or even up, well, like you said, West Virginia, where you generally do have a very concise peak of the rut as compared to down here in the deep south where we tend, generally tend to have a much longer rutting period and a much more suppressed peak of the rut. You might find some very, very different responses to scrapes. Well, good deal. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'm emptied out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're telling me we'd go 40 minutes. We've, we've been about an hour and 15 now, so. <laughs> All right, Carl. Well, thanks so much. Uh, great talking to you. Great seeing you. Hope we see you soon. And uh, j just uh, appreciate your time and, and sharing all your experience and knowledge. We thank you so much. I'm looking forward to finding out what you guys find out myself, guys. So keep, keep me in the loop. Look forward to all it, right, Carl. Buddy. You take care, guys. See you soon. Bye. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.